All right, cool. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for everybody. Thanks for your patience. I wanted to give that one more minute and make sure folks who wanted to be here could come in. Um, let me, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, I want to direct you over to the, the bottom of your screen here and look for the chat icon, a little bubble, a little chat bubble. We're going to be sharing information in that space. And if you can, please introduce yourselves there. Oh, that's just it. Let me put in, thanks for your patience here. So you can add your, uh, introduce yourself over there and any thoughts you may have on what you want to, uh, thoughts you may, questions you may have or thoughts you have on energy planning in San Antonio, how it's done, how you'd like to see it done. Um, I'm gonna add one other, uh, when I get deeper into this, I'll put the, the, the Facebook page up also, but let me do a real quick kind of like overview of where we are, what we're doing. Um, so my name is Greg Harmon. Uh, I should say also um, for, for those, there may be some joining us, um, if you uh, primarily first language in Spanish, uh, I should say bienvenidos y gracias a todas y todos. Si necesita traducción, uh, pres, uh, presión el botón en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Uh, tenemos un excelente traductor para ti. Um, and Laura Rios Ramirez is here um, and uh, doing the, the translation work. So let me quickly kind of put up our, our guests for the day. Um, Laura is a movement builder and educator and trainer of both indigenous and settler descent in Yanawana, Soma Sec territory, uh, where we are today, um, most of us. Uh, and they are committed to growing restorative and transformative justice practices as a co-CEO of De Corazon um, Circles. Laura enjoys supporting organizations that make movement accessible to Spanish speaking communities as part of her contribution in intersectional work. We're also going to be hearing from uh, Chrissy Mann, who's a colleague of mine at, at, at Sierra Club with the Beyond Coal campaign. And uh, she helps to lead and coordinate work around um, decarbonization of the energy sector uh, and uh, does a, a, an awful lot of work here in San Antonio. And so we're, we're, we're well familiar and, and, and do interact a lot. And I think some of those on the call know Chrissy um, as well. And, and her background comes back out of uh, environmental law and in administrative and regulatory side. Um, but she loves puppies. Um, oh, wait, no, it wasn't puppies. What was it? Connecting communities. That's right. <laughs> uh, knowledge and solutions. So welcome to Chrissy. And Didi Belmeres is a friend, a climate justice organizer, a public citizen. And uh, Didi was very prominent and active in the recall CPS campaign. Um, some of you may remember as an effort to move kind of like the center of governance from the board of trustees at CPS to the to the city council where the thought being that we could as a community uh, effect more um, change right and uh, on the push towards uh, energy democracy um, and so uh, her work revolves a lot around city climate planning and uh, and moving the city to a more sustainable future uh, with the center of that being around um, coal and the spruce ending, closing the spruce coal plant. Um, let's see, so we started this, this call is kind of part of a series and um, it, that begins, I guess, I'll, I'll do a quick outline before I introduce Didi, uh, began last year uh, as sort of a um, community response to the, the COVID crisis. I'm gonna slow myself down now a little bit for, the, for Laura and the translation. Um, I get excited. Um, and there is a lot, uh, the belief was and, and is that there's a lot in energy justice work um, that can empower uh, a community uh, in crisis. Um, and we certainly saw in this most recent event, uh, the winter storm, um, what poor planning can do um, and uh, a lack of investment in uh, sustainable and resilient uh, infrastructure and, and relationships. So we developed, uh, I'll put on the screen now, this is um, 
a set of uh, policy recommendations um, that to not only respond to the 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 need at that moment, which was uh, you know you know this economic collapse around around COVID, um, but also uh, looking at it from an intersectional space, um, which would include the public health. Uh, as well. So we, we drafted this letter to the mayor, to council, to the CPS Energy Board, you know, on these points, ending disconnections um, for the most vulnerable families, um, um, uh, elevating conservation, energy savings uh, as an element uh, of, of a COVID recovery, because there's so much connected that this could be skill sharing, jobs training, there's a lot there uh, and weatherization. Um, this is a critical, you know, we, as we learned recently, simply having insulation in the wall, uh, that could be a life or death issue. You know, we're used to probably used to heat stroke, you know, and heat death in San Antonio, but this was a, a really strong reminder for us. Um, no rate increases until rate structure, the structure of the rates is fair. Uh, and developing a climate, a community driven resource plan, which is where we are today, as well as the, the last point on that was to, to, to ensure that the spruce coal plant, uh, nearly half of all of our climate pollution uh, be shut down in 2030. Um, and so we've, we've been revisiting these, these points, these policy points um, for the past couple of months. Uh, and I'm gonna put some of these in the chat in just a second, you know, one of them, uh, the first one on disconnections, we've we've been expanding that um, uh, to to kind of do a better job, more thorough job, seeing uh, as clear, clearly as we have now uh, our vulnerabilities um, to extreme weather. So we've added on, you know, that that we want to reduce as much as possible any pass through of storm related, you know, power costs. We know that there are some of those who, you know, they, 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 they wouldn't even go so far as, you know, turn down their thermostat. And, and, and it's a complicated equation on who should or um, pay some or all or what, but it's, it's one we want to be having publicly. Um, developing a true, we have, CPS has a critical care program, but it only promises to keep somebody who's on, reliant on medical equipment up to date on their bills. Um, it doesn't, uh, promise uh, uninterrupted power. So it's something we need to address. Uh, and we are calling for an audit of existing the payment assistance programs, um, but also an assessment of energy burden. You know, why somebody on the, on the north side, they may pay, you know, uh, 30 cents uh, uh, out of every, you know, well, let's say, well, let's start here on the south side, one of every $4 that somebody earns is going to pay for water and power uh, power, electricity, and, and um, gas, uh, where there could be a very, very different equation uh, on in other parts of the city. So that's um, uh, the, the first one that we had a, a webinar a couple weeks ago on that. We, um, um, whoops, turned the wrong one on. Last week, we got into this, the, the energy efficiency issue. Um, and I talked a little bit about that, but that has specific policy goals uh, in terms of, you know, how aggressive we want to see and, you know, uh, the reduction in, 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 um, uh, in how much energy we use as a community. Uh, so if we can make somebody's home more energy efficient, particularly we want to target um, those in, uh, in low income and working uh, housing um, so that, you know, these, they're, they're more, uh, can have a better chance of surviving um, climate disasters uh, and positioning more solar, more battery storage in these historically uh, neglected communities. We're looking at resilient centers. Um, it, here in San Antonio, we have, I think, cooling centers. And then they were talking about heating centers. Um, ideally, people shouldn't have to leave their homes, um, but we want to make sure that there's community, like neighborhood by neighborhood, centers where people can be secure and share skills and grow food. Uh, and then this, uh, this other idea we haven't fleshed out is this idea of a climate conservation core um, where we can take, you know, insulation, weatherization, um, uh, energy efficiency programs all across the city and as a kind of like a mass employment response, but also something that's just that's dedicated to human security. So um, 
and in development are these others like these are all like public we're not doing these behind the door you know closed doors there are a number of organizations having these meetings uh, in coalition and developing these ideas and refining these ideas and taking them out to the public and having conversations um, and this webinar is part of that right uh, so community res community led resource planning that that Chrissy's going to talk about um, is is a critical one of these equity and rate sitting I saw Meredith on the call is is one that's coming up next week. Um, we can set a, any number of these up to develop in and to turn out in and campaign on, but we wanted to be a transparent uh, process. So uh, I'm trying to think I should check the the chat. Um, uh, and I should probably unpin myself. And I'm going to like to turn it over um, to Didi, uh, I think, who has a, has a lot to share um, on all of this. Um, but specifically, I, I think about um, Didi, and I, I really wanted to bring her on uh, in related to, you know, this idea of governance and the, and the work she's done uh, with the recall work and, and really thinking about what it takes to bring, you know, uh, people power into energy decisions. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to mute my mic now. I'm going to check the Facebook and uh, watch the chat and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. And thanks for everybody who, who joined and everybody who's come in to participate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an honor, I guess, did I, I don't think I even said uh, if you, uh, si necesita traducción, uh, presión el botón en la parte inferior uh, de la pantana, batalla. Uh, tenemos un excelente traductor party. Thank you, and uh, Didi, come on. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Greg, and um, thanks to everybody for uh, showing up tonight. Um, I know that uh, it's evening, some of y'all are could be zoomed out, um, and it's uh, maybe you're off of work, but you took some time to be here. So um, I want to appreciate. I want to say I appreciate everybody for being here. Um, like Greg said, I'm I'm, I'm going to be talking about the the importance of, of governance uh, models within our city as, as it's related to uh, CPS energy and uh, and all, to some extent also with SAWS. But my my work revolves uh, entirely around CPS. <clears throat> Before last month's uh, winter storm, Yuri, uh, most people had never heard of uh, the PUC or um, what for short is the Public Utilities Commission. This is the agency that regulates the state's uh, electric, uh, telecommunication and water and sewer utilities. <clears throat> On their website, they say their mission is to protect customers, foster competition and promote high quality infrastructure. After a uh, winter storm, Yuri, uh, the PUC, ERCOT, um, they were all over the news and social media because it failed all of Texas, even though they were supposed to protect um, its customers. But we can't place all of the blame on the PUC or ERCOT uh, because CPS Energy as well in the city failed to protect the people of San Antonio. So who should be holding CPS account accountable for this and protecting customers during normal times and during extreme weather events like the freeze. So um, the answer to that is the city council and uh, the mayor and also CPS Energy's uh, five member board of trustees. And here is the, you know, the, the council and the mayor's authority uh, when it comes to CPS Energy. First, um, it's in, in rate making, which is uh, super important right now. Um, if CPS Energy wants to increase uh, customers' rates, they have to make a case for that. Prior to last uh, month's winter storm, CPS Energy's CP, uh, CEO, Paula Gold Williams, um, has used fear mongering when she says that rates will increase for customers if they have to close the spruce coal plant sooner than planned. She claims that the cost of renewable energy would be part of their rate increase. CPS Energy is also saddled down with a billion dollars worth of debt on that coal plant. City Council has to use their authority to challenge that. And they can challenge CPS Energy by requiring a community led energy planning process that uh, Chrissy will uh, discuss in greater detail after me. Given that we're still in a global health crisis and people are suffering financially, 
And on top of that, a winter storm that's left thousands of people with busted pipes, council can do more to protect customers from rate increases. City Council also has um, authority over the Board of Trustees. The board is self-perpetuating, meaning the trustees nominate and appoint, appoint new members and council votes to approve them, which council does with little or no pushback on nominees. But council can do more to vet qualified board members who will do better to serve um, all of their customers, like people who have energy and environmental backgrounds rather than rubber stamping nominees that, almost entire, that are almost entirely from the business community. Many on council might not know this, but they also have the power to expand the board beyond the five members to seven. So council and the mayor have considerable oversight of the board and they should exercise the power to ensure that CPS Energy is transparent to the public, the customers, and that they are held accountable to us because we own the utility. While this might not be a direct authority that council has over CPS Energy, but it, it is well worth considering. And that's the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, or CAP for short. City Council passed uh, the CAP in October of 2019. Since then, it sat on a shelf up until recently. And in that plan are adaptation strategies to prepare San Antonio for a changing climate. A changing climate that would include hurricanes, droughts, wire, wildfires, and freezes. If we dig deeper into these strategies, you'll find that utility preparedness for climate impacts uh, are in there. There was there is a risk assessment of critical critical infrastructure. Um, the plan would assess emergency self emergency shelter policies, and emergency planning for vulnerable groups are all included in this plan. So once again, city and council and mayor could have exercised governance authority regarding adapt adaptation strategies with CPS Energy and SALS and help the city and its most vulnerable through this winter storm. And in all of this as voters, we have to hold city council and the mayor accountable for our utilities. Thanks for taking the time to hear me out today. Uh, I am now going to pass it on to Chrissy Mann. Thanks, Dee Dee. Um, and it, what a really great introduction to something a little bit more um, uh, siloed that I'm going to um, talk about. But it's all related to how, basically, how this city-owned utility goes about doing its business. Um, I think it's really important to sit with the fact that um, the city of San Antonio, which many folks on this that are listening um, to this um, presentation today are live in or are a customer, maybe people aren't don't live in the city of San Antonio, but they're a customer of CPS Energy. But the city of San Antonio owns this utility. They own CPS Energy. And what that means is it's, a, it's an asset of the city, right? It, it's, it doesn't function like a department, like the parks department. And we can talk about, and maybe Dee Dee is, um, is the one to lead some more conversation about how the how the utility should function but it's very important to understand it's an asset of the city it belongs to the people of san antonio just like the parks do and the street lights do and the infrastructure and the sidewalks and um and so that ownership that relationship between the people of san antonio and the utility is really key to some of the um, some of the proposals that Greg shared earlier. Like why why do we, a group of folks that just have a lot of opinions about how CPS Energy does its job, what what does it matter that we say? And particularly for folks who are customers of CPS Energy or that live in San Antonio, it matters a lot because you're the you're the people that. Um, they're effectively shareholders of this utility, right? So, um, sorry, I've got a static in my ear. So um, I think like I hold that really central whenever I think about why we're pushing CPS energy so hard. It's not just that they're running, um, that, they're, that they're the owners of the biggest greenhouse gas emitters in the region. 
It's not just that they're, they're producing power in a way that pollutes the air and water and people, but it's also the fact that like the people that actually, everyone that's getting polluted by this water and air and, and, and receiving the benefits too of the, of power um, are basically part owners of it. And and um, we've seen for too long the, the folks on the board of trustees, in particular one, <laughs> one trustee, um, feel like, well, this is a business. We, we're running our business and everyone else needs to get out of our way. And that's just not the case. So one of the thing, one of the issues that I really glommed on to because, because when I started working with um, my, now my friends, but folks here in San Antonio around CPS energy issues, um, and specifically the spruce coal plant was um, an astound sort of an astonishment about how CPS engages with the public around issues that the public really has every right to know about. It almost felt like they produced material information on a need to know basis and then they publicized it and they put on a road show and they sold it as opposed to participating in um, decision-making with the community and then doing, um, you know, implementing a strategy that was based on community input. That just wasn't and still isn't the case. It isn't the case even though they hold um, environmental stakeholder meetings with many of the people that are listening and participating on this, on this panel. It isn't the case even though they should be more responsive to city council, which are elected officials representing um, at least people in San Antonio that live in San Antonio that are often CPS energy customers, or they are definitely CPS energy customers. So with that sort of understanding and realizing like we're not gonna get anywhere just sort of asking, hey, why don't you listen to our really great ideas? We think you should retire the coal plant. We think it's too expensive. It's definitely hurting people. It's definitely caused uh, contributing to climate change. Um, those we had no all. It was a one way conversation. Like we produced information, we produced reports, and we had analysis, and we had editorial boards agreeing, you know, with us. And by the we, I mean specifically Sierra Club producing some reports, but many people supporting um, that advocacy on on this um, across the city of San Antonio. And, um, and what's missing is a an actual dialogue, an actual process to engage with um, city council and the board and CPS Energy on these issues. And so that's a long-winded introduction to um, to to um, say what what we need to pose this um, recommendation and uh, sort of assertion as what we need in part is a truly comprehensive community driven resource planning process. When I use the word resource here, I'm talking about a generation asset, like a coal plant, like a wind, wind farm, solar panels. I'm also really talking about like energy efficiency and demand response programs. Anything that can be used to um, reduce need um, for, for power or provide power. So it can be supply side, like a power plant or demand side, like weatherization. And um, so, and that just doesn't exist. What we were seeing out of city, um, out of CPS Energy was a sort of a series of releases of plans. So for example, the flex step or what most folks here is probably so called the step program this is the, um, very broadly the energy efficiency program. <clears throat> Excuse me. The energy efficiency program um, includes a broad array of things like, um, like distributed solar, weatherization programs, probably roof programs, a whole bunch of stuff. And it has goals and it's a good thing. It's a thing that needs to exist. And it's a thing that can be made better in response to new and growing technologies and understanding about how energy efficiency can be used to be a true asset and be a true resource in system planning. And if you weren't, if you didn't join the last one um, and you're interested in digging into that, that is what, um, folks on the last webinar that Greg mentioned earlier talked about. And so, but that's part of the planning, right? Like what kind of demand response programs can we put? What, how do we reduce the need for more power in the first place? Um, 
Also, part of the planning is like, okay, we've got some old coal plants. What do we do with them? We've got some old gas plants. What do we do with them? Um, how do we bring on new technologies like batteries and um, more advanced wind and solar? And what does it mean? What is that? What is, what can energy storage mean? So it's all this really cool, exciting things, and we saw some of that um, in the CPS Energy's um, report that they released on what did they call it? Let me look it up. Can't remember what they called it, but it's the one we were all looking for with the um, spruce. Um, the resource plan, I remember. They, yeah, they called it a resource plan, but it had a it had another like trademark name because everything has a new trademark, right? And um, in any event, yeah, the their resource plan included more than just spruce. So it was a good start to something somewhat comprehensive that evaluated all of the existing resources and, and sort of made some assertions about demand and made some assertions about um, other, other components of this resource plan. So that's what we've seen. We've seen that most recently, this big, big production of a release uh, when we've been asking the environmental community and, and others in um, public health community been asking for a for some analysis around the spruce retirement. Like when when can you retire it? What's the cost gonna be? What's it gonna look like? How much is it gonna cost? And, um, and we were stonewalled for a really long time because even though many in the environmental community knew that CPS and, and CPS Energy had in fact done an analysis. They wouldn't release any of the dates or any of the data rather. So a, lot, a little bit of background. We also have seen a, a request for proposal around um, issuing, you know, issued about uh, some uh, resource generation assets like solar and um, battery storage and what they're calling a firming capacity, which could be gas, could be batteries, could be some sort of combination of um, wind and solar and batteries. Um, and then again, the flex step. Sounds kind of discombobulated because it is, and that's the problem. Um, they're not doing any of this planning um, comprehensively and not in any way that anybody could sort of, even at a technical level, sit down and go through it and understand um, like how the part, parts are fitting together. Um, and so that's for like, so, you know, people who are, do that for a living, it's, it's somewhat incomprehensible. And then for people who are living their lives and still want to understand, like, how is this utility again, that I'm basically a part owner of how, what are their plans for the future? What are they, what are they, are they taking into account climate? Chrissy, issues? could I ask you to slow down a little bit, please? Or, um, or the cost for moving forward, um, with the status quo. And there just hasn't been an opportunity. I don't know there. if you heard that from Laura. Um, just to slow the slow down, slow Sorry. a little bit. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so um, so all of this discombobulated um, way of presenting information to the public, to the board, I assume to city council and not a consistent um, method of asking for input. We have seen town halls where they have, where hundreds of people show up because they want, because um, people want to say something about the continued use and reliance of coal, on coal. We've seen um, sort of um, neighborhood events where CPS energy goes out and takes input. What we have not seen as a process that both takes input and responds to it in a way that um, that incorporates that input and and stakeholders, the community can understand. Well, here's how they responded to my ask or my request. And so, um, it's a little it's it's a little unusual for resource planning, particularly of a um, what should be a regulated utility or a public utility in this case um, to move forward like this. So it, um, my assertion is, my argument is, our argument I think is that both the city and the board of trustees, the city council board of trustees need to provide some sort of regulatory oversight of CPS energy. Didi mentioned the public utility commission 
that's what the PUC does, the Public Utility Commission, for other monopoly utilities. CPS Energy is a monopoly utility. If you're served by them, you do not have a choice of another electric provider. And so there's this extra weight, this extra need for city council and the board of trustees to do their jobs and make sure that CPS Energy is doing right by the customers, by the ratepayers, and by the community that they are both owned by and, and serve. And um, the good thing about public power is that you should have influence on what their what their policies are, what their ability, how they're able to respond to um, issues like climate change, like um, resilience, all of these things that we're dealing with really urgently right now. Because it's public power, because they should be responsive to their community, um, they should be nimble enough to make those to make those pivots and to make those and to implement those um, policies in a way that it um, reflects the needs of the community that they serve. Um, before I jump into some proposals. Yeah, I think I'm ready to jump into some proposals. So that is a general thesis like CPS energy needs to be regulated. They need to be regulated on, on the side of resource planning Didi mentioned rates as well. And this is why I think city council should also be really interested in the resource planning. We obviously, from a resilience standpoint, we need to understand why we're, why 10 years after another storm, the coal plant is unable to perform in a very basic capacity. Did they not do weatherization? Was it too expensive? What decisions were made um, that, led CPS Energy to be in the position that they are in today. So those are some basic questions that need to be answered. And city council clearly has a vested interest in getting those answers. And um, so that, that goes into resource planning, part of the resiliency, but also as part of a rate making obligation that city council has and no argument there, city council approves rates. Um, the flex program, the flex step program rather, is um, positioned as a rate. In other words, it's a part of your every your everyone's bill, and because it's a an, an additional part that that everyone is asked to pay, it's part of the rates, and that's why city council has to approve it. Unlike if CPS Energy just wants to um, spend uh, you know fifty million dollars on a on a motor that went out on one of the spruce units, they don't need to seek city council approval, or at least they don't right now, because they they view that as a different kind of expense that's going to get wrapped up as a maintenance expense, but is not specifically a, a, a component of rates. So that's sort of the division there. We've got city council, okay, they think their obligation and their authority sort of begins and ends with rates. And um, I, and I'm challenging that assumption, to say like also resource planning because they are two sides of the same coin. Resource planning is very forward looking. And it says like, what kind of decisions are you making now about the next 10 to 20 years or whatever time frame they're gonna do a resource plan for. And then a rate making is sort of a backwards looking, like it's adjusting, it should, and I don't really know, have a good feel for how CPS Energy does it because they don't engage in a formal rate making process like you might see at the Public Utility Commission or in other places with rate cases, which is like a litigated um, process to evaluate whether the rates are fair and reasonable. But anyway, so rate making is backward looking. They look at a what they, let's call the test year. You take a year and you evaluate your expenses you evaluate how much money you brought in, how much money went out, and um, you decide what rates need to be moving forward based on sort of a historic window. Obviously those things need to work together because if you spent money on a resource you shouldn't have, like um, money to prop up a coal plant that is not a, a smart investment, um, you, might not, you might not be able, you maybe in a perfect world, you shouldn't be able to recoup that expense gets complex with public power because the entity that would eat that expense is quite frankly, the entity that owns it, which is the city or CPS energy. But it is important to have this sort of backward and forward um, 
um, partnership in, um, in, in evaluating CPS Energy's day-to-day um, -day business. And that's why city council needs to be part of that process, not just the board of trustees with you know, a one-off um, presentation at one of their board meetings. City council needs to be part of a long range planning process that should feed into how, how rates are decided um, as well. So they have some options. They're not doing anything yet. And we don't really know how the rate advisory committee is gonna move forward. Um, when we get to Q and A, if somebody does, please correct me, and please correct me on any of this stuff. I'm not, I'm not a perfect expert on, on any of this, and many of you have been working in this field a lot longer than me, and by field I mean in San Antonio. So, um, but we have some options. CPS Energy right now has not undergone a public resource planning process that I know of. Again, they release stuff, they ask for input on it, they move forward. Sometimes they change direction. For example when the first most recent like power flex power bundle um came out the firming capacity was not specific it, it was originally going to be like existing gas within the ERCOT market and a lot of people advocated against that and said don't don't presume what you need by firming capacity meaning let the let the market tell you it could be batteries it could be wind and solar and batteries and so that was a, a really healthy change that they had and that's the kind of back and forth we need to see sort of memorialized in an actual process because I'm almost sure they're going to get better, um, better, you know, proposals by keeping it um, sort of like an, an all resource option rather than getting it narrow to what they think the best option is going to be. So that's, that was really exciting. And it shows that they're, that they can be new, um, um, flexible and they can respond to, to good advocacy. And that's exactly why um, that we should have a, a more open resource planning process. Um, so there's a couple of models that we've been um, talking about with um, anyone who will listen, basically. There is a utility called Excel, E-X-C-E-L. And Excel owns a couple of power plants, um, coal power plants in Texas, far west Texas, one near Amarillo, northwest. and one even closer to the New Mexico border. And Excel is trying to figure out when they're going to retire um, one of those plants because they're running out of groundwater. And, and they're going to have to convert or retire the other plant because it's too um, dirty. It's making too much sulfur dioxide pollution. And so they are engaging in a process specific to, to the first plant called TOLK, T-O-L-K. And they're trying, and they're doing that with stakeholders that are interested. They're running technical conferences. They're having back and forths with, and, and all of this is over Zoom, of course, right now. Um, and it's part of a New Mexico proceeding because these plants serve folks in Texas and New Mexico, all outside of ERCOT. Um, so there's technical conferences. There's a back and forth. It is. Um, it's been really productive. We've been participating in it. They are responsive to our requests for specific retirement scenarios. Like, why won't you run this, this date and this date? Why don't you phase them out this way and see what the cost would be, for example. And um, that has been really productive. And that has been, you know, focused on one coal plant. We've, we've, we've piggybacked the second one in there too. That wasn't the original focus. And that the results of that, of all of that planning and analysis, which we don't have yet, um, that's forthcoming in the next, I think next month, the results of that will then um, feed into what is called an integrated resource planning process, which is basically what I've been proposing for um, CPS Energy, but in a very formal like agency driven way, the New Mexico Public Regulation Commission, so their version of a PUC um, requires this on a, I think every five, every three year basis. I should know that better. Every three to five year basis, they require it. And it's basically an update um, from, from the, pre, the prior plan to say like, this is what we know has changed. Here are our different cost assumptions. And it's iterative and it moves um, 
it moves the planning forward. None of these are stuck in time forever. So this idea that CPS Energy invented this flexible planning is, is not true. What they did was create um, new no nomenclature around planning and pulled it out of understood sort of terms that the rest of the industry has been using for, for decades. That's another story. So what we what's really great about that is the back and forth. What's really great about that is the access that um, stakeholders have to the utility and their responsiveness. What's not great about it is it's, it's wonky. Um, it's these meetings have been taking place in the middle of the day. And there's some real process problems with access for, um, for folks in the community that maybe not want to drill down to a specific retirement date, but want to have more conceptual conversations and see priorities like health impacts or climate impacts or bill impacts really at the forefront. And um, I don't think that means what we should ignore that process. I think it means we should improve upon it. Another option or a model, not really an option, is Austin Energy. I love talking about Austin Energy in comparison to CPS Energy um, because they can both learn a lot from each other. They're both very similarly situated within the ERCOT market. Austin is a, um, is a publicly owned utility, just like CPS Energy. They own a little bit of nuclear, a little bit of coal, a little bit of um, gas, a bunch of wind, solar. They're working on adding more battery storage. They have the same components in their portfolio as um, CPS Energy, different levels, right? Again, just down the road or up the road, depending on where you are, and um, slightly different governance structures, as, I, as I'm sure those who worked on the recall petition are fully aware. Um, Austin's um, board, Austin Energy's board, is the city council. They do not have an independent board. Austin Energy has, there are two commissions that um, oversee um, Austin Energy work that then report to council. And those are called the um, Electric Utility Commission and the Resource Management Commission. And they're made up of community volunteers, very much like some of the commissions in San Antonio. Um, and then they review proposals. And those proposals, um, I guess they vote on them. They come out. Sometimes there's a joint meeting of the two commissions and they have a proposal that pops out that they've approved through a vote and that goes to city council. And those kind of proposals can and do include resource plans. So does Austin do the kind of resource plan where any stakeholders can sit down with the utility the way I described earlier? No. Is there much more access to the public to be part of the resource planning process? Yes. But is it perfect? Absolutely not. Um, the critiques that my colleagues that work extensively with Austin Energy would say is that there is a lack of transparency and um, a lack of public input because it's just limited on who's going to show up. And this sounds probably really familiar. Like there's not because there's not formal process to invite like specific technical engagement. It gets it gets to be challenging. So, um, what else can I say about that? And then a the third model um, coming out of New Orleans, they have a, um, they, they oversee a utility, the Entergy utility that operates within New Orleans and New Orleans Parish. Um, they, the city of New Orleans oversees that, that, that utility. And so they have a subcommittee that oversees it and advises council on, the, on those, on utility matters, including best practices. The city of New Orleans has created ordinances and detailed rules for reviewing applications for rates and um, resource planning. And so they set out minimum expectations, minimum public participation requirements, for example, for the utility to, um, to, to operate by. And um, that seems like a nice mix of the two to me. And so I think that's something that I, I'm going to be interested in exploring more with, with folks um, about whether or not San Antonio and CPS Energy needs something like a model um, 
integrated resource planning rule, a model rate making rule, um, so that the city and CPS Energy have shared expectations for that moving forward and something that the community can rely, up, rely upon. Um, so some notes from, from someone who knows more about it than me. It says that each stage of the process from the development of the initial cost and energy needs to the draft um, proposal altogether. The rules provide opportunities for stakeholder feedback and require the utility to respond to requests for information. And that's the last thing I'll note is um, part, I think a lot of people on this call and on this webinar and who are listening have had plenty of access to CPS Energy. And we've all been in lots and lots of meetings. We've had a lot of access to senior leadership there that I think I would actually commend CPS for. The, pro, the, the, the critique I have is the um, inability to get detailed information back from them that, to aid us in our own analyses. And um, a lot of times that comes under the cover of confidentiality because we're in a competitive market. And, um, and I think that that ha has just served as an unnecessary um, cover and roadblock to getting access to, to important information. And there are ways to work around that. And we can do that with you know, non-disclosure agreements and in the context of a very formal um, um, process. And we can also find ways to really slightly less um, uh, detailed or granular information. And the city of Austin is able to do that with Austin Energy. And we did finally see some of that coming out with the um, CPS Energy's resource plan, but it took a really long time to get there. And um, now we're left with kind of what next. And they, CPS Energy said they want to engage in a public dialogue. This tend to be like very superficial and not really exchanging information. So I'd really love, love to know more what they think a dialogue is and how we can improve upon that with some process and some expectations set by the mayor, the city council, and by the, the board of trustees. So, oh, and one thing I didn't, I need to end on as well. That is describing like a very broad, like a long-term, hopefully medium term, improvement to the way um, city council, I'm sorry, the way CPS would do business in the short term. And I know this feels a little like in contrast to what I just described, but in the short term, we need to take the um, retirement decisions around Spruce and put some urgency around them and get a commitment um, to, to set some back-end retirement dates for Spruce that reflect the, the climate urgency and the needs for the city to um, comply with things like the ozone unattainment standards. Or, and so um, my recommendation there and some of our recommendations there are to take that as almost like a, a test for how public participation can work and really set up a, pro a, a process with CPS Energy and not just the environmental stakeholders, but a broader stakeholder group and move that forward around specifically Spruce and um, test out some of the stuff. Like, I don't know what's gonna work best for San Antonio. And I don't, and I would almost assert pretty fanatically that CPS doesn't either because they haven't done it right yet. And so this could be a really great opportunity to partner and develop a process, but we can't do it just by our, like our advocacy alone. We have to have support and um, demands from city council, the board of trustees and support probably from CPS Energy themselves. That was a lot. Thank you for listening. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Greg. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, I've got one question up in stack. I want to, um, at this point, just, just to recognize that what we're talking about this is intended as an open conversation, um, uh, community conversation. We want to be clear that everything we've been advocating for, um, the values that we're uh, kind of trying to develop and pull out of each other are, are, are deep in community spaces. We want, when we talk about, you know, 
prioritizing. These are issues of disconnections. These are issues of, you know, fair rate structures, you know, or uh, energy burden, right? Um, it's about having safe housing, whether it's the materials in the house um, that may off gas or lead or, or what have you, um, or the, the lack of insulation. Um, that we're interested in community-led planning because we believe that's where the creativity um, lives is with the people uh, who know that what their needs are best. And we're interested in preventing or slowing down or dampening climate impacts um, that we know a certain amount are due, no matter what we do, um, but our behaviors can, um, our policies can keep people safe safer um, if we work collaboratively. So um, I put in the chat these different points that we're, we've been negotiating in among our organizations and we'll be bringing forward in a public campaign. This is one of those. Uh, and I have one question uh, on stack uh, on this subject, but I wanna say quickly that um, there's also an ongoing investigation right now into kind of like, um, uh, why things broke down the way they did, why the, 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 the failure, the, the blackout, um, the, 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 um, the, how the water shutoffs, uh, and all of that. And so I'm just putting into the chat also, this is a link to the committee. It's mostly, uh, current council members and one former council member, and then two others. It's not a lot of community present in this, um, mayor appointed committee. Um, but there, um, I do bring it to you for two reasons. One, to point out that there's an opportunity there um, to push um, for the kind of recommendations to tell, tell our stories. And so we, we push through our telling of our stories, um, recommendations that are responsive to our needs. Um, and that also it's become clear observing these meetings that San Antonio has a long history of creating plans and maps about our vulnerabilities, um, the things that uh, make us not safe or some much less safe than others. Uh, but we don't have a long history of investing in the strategies that we identify as, as a community. So two places to push there. And also um, thank you to Laura for the uh, translation work I, I, the intention here is to reach into uh, as much of the community as we can. Um, and this recording, there will be an English uh, language recording and a Spanish language recording uh, at this site, climateactionessay.com, where we're, we're holding all these materials related to the development of this campaign. And so I hope you will go over to that site, um, use what you find there, if you want to um, uh, get more actively involved uh, in any of this work, I'm putting my email up also. Uh, though anybody here, I'm sure would uh, be happy to connect. It's uh, coming up on uh, uh, seven and I saw a hand go up and then I saw maybe it went down. Um, but I do have a question from Meredith. It didn't find its way into the chat but it did find its way into my email, uh, which is uh, for anyone really here, or Dee Dee or, or, or Chrissy, um, that we, we know a lot about what went wrong um, with the winter storm. Um, but it's highly likely that the, the next disaster will be a severe uh, and punishing heat wave. That's um, uh, the most likely forecast uh, along with serious drought. So how might community-led energy planning help us better cope or prepare for that than relying upon the current kind of like the status quo? So maybe that is a, a, a Chrissy question. I recognize at seven o'clock we were going to try to close at seven, um, but in, in, for those who need to get off, um, it's with a lot of gratitude and appreciation um, that uh, for, for your time. Um, and I hope we can connect more, uh, in this work, uh, moving forward. It's a, it's a critical time. Um, but I do want to, um, invite, thank you, uh, Lindsay, uh, Chrissy, if you want to respond to Meredith's yeah. question. So Thanks. 
I'll, I'll talk about Mary's question in two parts. First, identifying what the solutions are to keeping people safe is the first part. And that might not be part of resource planning, but so we have a group of folks, whoever they are, is it weatherization, is it more cooling centers, is it, whatever that is, identifying what the solutions are and then plugging that in into the resource planning process. And so this is where responding to community needs is so urgent. And what's so great about resource community-led resource planning or integrated resource planning process is you can put whatever parameters you need. You don't need to just plug in what's the cheapest way to do X. What you need to do is what's the, like considering this, we have to, um, you know, improve our weatherization program to, you know, X percentage, or we, you can create parameters that solve for your concern. How do we prepare for heat waves and plug it into the resource planning? So if for some reason it requires more power, then you plug that in as additional demand. If for some reason it, then it impacts the, the demand a different way, then you would plug that in differently. So that's what I would say about that is like, it is a perfect opportunity to be responsive to what community needs are. And if it's a community need in San Antonio, but not in um, Omaha, Nebraska, that's, you plug it in in San Antonio differently than you would in Omaha, Nebraska. So I hope that was helpful. And I can stick on a little bit longer if um, other folks like to chat. Cool, yeah. I, I don't see a lot of hands waving. So um, so maybe you're good. If, if someone does have a question, we'll, we'll, we'll hold here for, for one more minute. Uh, you can type, uh, simply type stack into the chat um, uh, or, or hold your hand up. But I think... Uh, yeah, I could add on to that, just in addition to like that kind of thing, what San Antonio also needs to figure out how to do is respond to ozone non-attainment. That's a parameter that you should say, like we need to create a resource plan that is responsive to that. And so that's how you also put the cap goals in there. So the cap is, have goals that are set out. So put them in their resource planning and use those as, as, as parameters for what you have to achieve by when. Oh, okay. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it here. Dee Dee, do you have any parting words, words of encouragement or challenge or comfort? I uh, just want to thank everybody for showing up today, and thank you, Chrissy, for uh, for your presentation too. Yeah, and, and Laura, uh, thank you for your work over there. I know we uh, got going. Um, oh. Hold on, we're gonna hold the call for Meredith. How does Austin Energy Rate Structure support the changes in generation resources and how does that make the rates more fair? Can you handle that in brief? Uh, I think everybody's ready to- Yeah, so to it's move. pretty new. Yeah, real briefly. Um, both of those things are kind of works in progress. Um, they, in, in Austin, they had their first rate case. They created a proper structure for that. And, um, but they had to figure out how they were gonna pay to shut down the coal plant or their share of the coal plant by 2022. So that part was already in the resource plan and then figuring out how those, how it impacted the rates came as part of the rate case and making sure that was just and equitable was really hammered out in the rate case. So they are, they do, they are, they, they do feed into each other a yeah. lot there. And I, I did see just lastly, um, Juan Mancia says, has come on the tribal chair of the Carrizo Comacurudo tribe of Texas. And I, I think you wanted to offer a quick update maybe. Um, I can bring you off of, you can unmute your mic if you wanted to share, but I just, I know you wanted to drop in uh, for a quick Yeah, update. how are you? Hey Juan, can good you hear to me? hear you. Yeah, I do, it's good to hear you. Yeah. Um, Heading back, I'm here in Lusk. Lusk, um, I guess Wyoming. And we're heading down, down. We came back home. I just came up to leave some siding over at the Cheyenne River Reservation that mm -hmm. I was that I promised to take up there. Cool. But um, no, I'm just um, I just uh, kind of we kind of all kind of excited about the Anova LNG down in Brownsville being closed down. Mm -hmm. um, shouldn't it's uh, not getting uh, refusing to get another permit 
Uh, basically, all the LNGs that, that are going to be around the Port Isabel right now are really struggling with looking for investors and things. So, mm -hmm. I suggest you, uh, you know, kind of help the tribe on that and and look at the um, the people in, in in that area who have really worked hard, like uh, Becca Hinojosa, mm -hmm. trying to. Both of us went to France to try to try to get the banks to stop investing into these things, and I think it's probably one of the best things that we can do. And, and, and when it comes to this, you know, I think that, you know, well, after what, what happened this past, you know, month with that snow vid, I think we need to be aware that, you know, there has to be a way that, um, I mean, even water is being charged for nowadays and um, the resources of the land that, that were primarily free when they first came here are now being charged for everything. The wind is the wind is now wind powered is being charged. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to start looking at these things and knowing that there's there's a connection to the to these resources that come from the land, mm -hmm. especially with the coal mines and things like that. And we need to um, find a way to to start, um, I guess, changing the narrative in a sense to make it sound a little bit more. Um, it's not, it's not so much of a struggle for everybody, mm -hmm. especially the, the, the people that, that I know that we helped out through the mutual aid uh, assistance that we put together and still work is still working at it, trying to help a lot of the people who are still their bills were high. My bills were high and, and we were on a co-op. So it was from CPS. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. I think that it's important that we recognize that. And if we can stand together as a community and realize, you know, that there's there's resources here that uh, are still being taken after 500 years of occupation, because what that's the reason they came here was for gold and whatever they wanted, and now they're still taking the resources, the coal, the oil, and, you know, the gas and uranium. You t you can talk about it all you want, but it's still the same thing. Nothing has changed, and we mm -hmm. allow it to happen, and we become part part of that indentured servitude that is um that they they work off of and um I mean, the grid what happened to it was ridiculous and mm -hmm. of course i'm not going to pull any punches on it. and i think that people need to realize that there has to be some kind of um economic um, um equity in what's going on not the dis mm -hmm. not the not the continual disparity because um people still have to you know buy their homes buy the lumber to build their homes and all of that, and it's, and it's the earth that's suffering, you know, because it's cutting. Mm -hmm. We just went through the black, those black hills, and they're cutting, and like at the big thicket, they're cutting trees down for lumber. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to we need to be aware of what's going on around us. Mm -hmm. And big trees, big trees like the Anova LNG, mm -hmm. is you know, is a great victory for all of us because that, that leaves only two left, and their stock is really low. So we're even considering buying the rest of the stock and then shutting it down and filing bankruptcy so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. yeah I, I definitely can vouch for that I, I put a, a link here in the chat uh, for folks to support the tribe and in, in your work in the, the mutual aid work you do um, we got to go easy on our translator Laura Rio Ramirez um, uh, I know uh, she they've been carrying a lot on this conversation <laughs> we had a lot of words um, but I appreciate you and, you know, I do, um, and, um, we've had some good conversations in the past about, um, you know, what it means to, uh, the, the process of becoming human maybe for, for, especially for kind of like the, 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 the settlers, settler minds and, uh, like myself, uh, living here in Stoknan land. Um, so thank you for those words and, and I hope we can follow up and maybe do a broadcast um, uh, on everything that you've, you've got going, not just a Nova, but much more, but I do encourage people to click on the Caruso Como Crudo nation.com, uh, on the chat and, and, and help out. So thank you for, for calling in. I appreciate everybody joining in.